things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn amen, among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called, and those he called. He also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. Amen. Good morning, Storyline. How you doing? Great. Wow, you guys sound awesome. Uh, I'll apologize for how I sound, too. I got, I got a little bit of a cold, seven or eight days, weird symptoms. I can't smell anything, can't taste. It's a joke. It's a joke. Some of you are like, I can't believe he's already joking about that. Some of you are like, I can't believe it took him this long to joke about that. Can't keep everybody happy. Hey, uh, do, I do pardon me. I'm, I'm, I am struggling a little bit with a little bit of a head cold, uh, but I'm, I'm feeling better. Thanks for those of you who prayed for me this week. Uh, but we're continuing in Romans chapter 8. So if you have a copy of God's Word, I'd encourage you to turn to Romans chapter 8. If you don't have your own Bible, there's a Bible in the seat in front of you that you can grab. And Romans chapter 8 is on page 1002. You can go ahead and just turn there. I want to catch you up on where we've been so far. Not, I'm not going to do a whole summary like I've done some weeks, but just it's important for us to know why Paul is about to say what he's about to say in this passage because of what's come before it. So Paul is a church planting pastor. He's going up and down the Mediterranean seaboard, helping to plant churches and start churches. This church in Rome, he did not start, but he knows there's some challenges they're facing. So he writes this letter to them. The challenges that they're facing specifically is that there's two groups in the church. There's a group of, of Jewish Christians in the church and a group of Gentile Christians in the church. And the Jewish Christians are saying, we believe that the gospel is that we believe in Christ alone, but we also have to do all this other Jewish stuff like circumcision, food laws, and Sabbath. So all you Gentiles, if you really want to be faithful Christians, not only do you have to believe in Jesus, but you have to follow the law. And all these Gentile Christians are like, there is no way in the world we're getting circumcised. We believe in faith alone, in Christ alone. And actually, none of our life has to change. We can keep living licentiously. Yes, we, we are sinners and we can keep being sinners. And Paul is writing to both of them that you both have part of the gospel right. And the part that you have right is that we are all sinners. Sin is the great equalizer before God. And it is through faith alone in Christ alone that we are made righteous. And it's not through keeping of the law that we're saved, but by faith. But it is that kind of faith that helps us by the spirit become obedient to the law. Does that make sense? So in Romans chapter five, he says, you're either in Adam or you're in Christ. You've died to your previous selves, Romans chapter six, so you can live a new life in Jesus. Should we go on sinning, Gentiles? No. How could you keep sinning? You have died to it. And in, in Romans chapter seven, he, he really humanizes the gospel for us and says, and life is still hard. We still kind of continue to walk through challenges. In Romans chapter eight, he hits one of the pinnacles of his argument where he says so clearly that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jew or Gentile, faith in Christ, you're no longer condemned. It doesn't matter what your past was, what your present is, or what your future will be. If you have faith in Christ, you stand without any condemnation, amen? And he starts walking through Romans chapter eight. So therefore you now can live a life in the spirit. You crucify the flesh, live lives in the spirit. And what he talked about last week, I wanna highlight for us again. So I'm actually gonna read a, 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 the paragraph we covered last week just to remind us why he's talking about what he's talking about this week. Romans chapter eight, verse 26, he says, in the same way, the spirit helps us in our weakness. So he's identifying with this gritty humanity that faces challenges and sufferings and, and present issues in our world. And the weakness specifically is because we don't even know how to pray or how we should, but the spirit himself intercedes for us. So part of the gospel for Paul is that God does everything for us. Everything that God commands, God supplies, even when our prayer life struggles. Even when we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, groaning, unable to say what we're asking for from God, what Paul is saying is the spirit even then enters in. The gospel is not God does 99% and you do the last 1%. The gospel is that God saves from beginning to end. So what he's saying is, is that we are in this moment of present weakness. Verse 27, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the spirit because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So he's saying, you have been adopted, you're co-heirs, you've been given a new identity, you have, the present, you have the presence of the Holy Spirit with you. But last week, as he identifies with our current situation, our, our current reality, he's also saying, and you're still suffering. Life hasn't turned out the way you thought it was going to turn out. Our current reality is that 
we're still living in this broken world. In the paragraph before that, we talked about from groans to glory, that even creation itself is living under this futility, this brokenness, and it's trying to break free from the bondage. It's trying to break free from the futility and the curse that it is under. And so he says, eagerly wait, pray in the spirit. Last week, we talked about in this life of uncertainty, we look back towards God's faithfulness and say, God, thank you. We look forward towards God's promises and we say, God, won't you? But last week was really a week where Paul is focusing our attention on the things we don't know. And that's the life that you and I live in, right? We don't know if we're gonna have the same job we have now five years from now, or if we're gonna get that paycheck that we need in order to make rent. Or some of you in the room, you're not sure, like maybe some of you in the room thought your marriage would be in a healthier place than it is right now. You, a lot of you guys just like looked at each other. That was weird. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Some of you guys in the room are like, I, I thought I'd be married by now. Some of you in the room are thinking, I thought I'd have that job or I'd have that degree or, or I wouldn't be struggling with that sin anymore. I thought my anxiety would be dispelled of by now. Why am I still living in this present reality? And Paul is entering in and saying, hey, there's things that are uncertain in this world. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. That's how the Holy Spirit groans for us and speaks to God for us. But here, I need you to see this. Paul in the text is about to make a transition. Verse 26, he says, the spirit helps us in our weakness because we don't know, right? We don't know. There's things we don't know, uncertainty. But he's gonna make a transition for us this week to say, well, what can be certain? So here's what I need you to hear, maybe more than anything else. The Christian life is not simply a life of uncertainty. It's a life of being certain in the right things. Does that make sense? A way to be absolutely miserable in this life is to be certain about things that are uncertain and uncertain about things that are certain. Does that make sense? And the way to joy is to be uncertain about the things that are uncertain and certain about the things that are certain. If I were to sum up 99% of my counseling meetings, my phone calls, my emails with you as I seek to pastor and shepherd this church, it is all around this issue. Our anxiety, our depression, our frustration, our sadness, our loneliness, even our joy can sometimes come from uncertain things that we were never meant to place our hope in in the first place. And when those things get shaken, when those realities get moved and we don't place our hope in the things that are certain, that's where pastoral counseling arises. That's, that's the moment that Paul is trying to shift us and say, guys, there's lots in life that you cannot be certain about, but there's also some really important things that you can take to the bank. Well, what are those things? What are the things that we can be certain about? Paul is absolutely adamant. Verse 26, we don't know, but look at this contrast. Verse 28, we know. Verse 26, we don't know. Verse 28, we know. Well, what is he gonna tell us that we know? He says, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Verse 30, and those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. So the, the number one thing Paul is trying to get you to see, lots in life that you should be uncertain about in these present sufferings, but he is going to ground our hope with an immovable foundation of the things that you and I can absolutely take to the bank and be absolutely certain about. There's three things I want you to see. The first is the simplest and it's also the quickest. It's that God is good. God is good. One of the most important things for a Christian to sing, to pray, to articulate, to say to one another in this moment of uncertainty, in the moment of trial, in the moment of doubt, is to cast all of our cares on the character of God because the Bible says he is good, amen? That God alone is good. And this is what he says next. Not only is God good, point number two is he's working all things together for good. Look at verse 28. We know that all things, the Greek word there is panta, and it doesn't mean some things or like, like part of things. He's basically saying that every single circumstance in your life, God is orchestrating intentionally for your good. Remember the story of Joseph where Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers? Anybody have that happen to them? Because that would stink, right? And, he, and, and, and at the end of that story, Joseph is like, hey, I know what you intended for evil, God intended for good. That's what Paul's saying here, is that no matter what happens to you in life, no matter what present trial you're walking through, no matter what grief you're enduring, no matter what challenge you currently have, God is working it for good, all of it. 
every single part of it. So sometimes those things that we're praying, God, would you remove that from me? Maybe we should, but sometimes we should also be praying, God, would you use that to make me more like Jesus? God, that grief and suffering, we should maybe pray we should remove it, but our greatest prayer should be, God, would you use it? God, would you make me more like Jesus? Because that's what he says he's going to do. Let's keep reading. It's not only that he's using all things together for good, like an orchestra. He's saying God never deserts you in any circumstance in life. But for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose, verse 29, for those he foreknew, he predestined to what? This is the good. The good is that you would be conformed into the image of his son, that you would be more like Jesus. We're simplifying it, making it as simple as possible. What Paul is saying is that if you love God, if you are in Jesus Christ, if you are a Christian, every single circumstance in life, all the highs, all the lows, God uses them to make you more like Jesus. Every single one of them, even the ones that you most don't want. So a few uh, years ago, it's about 10 years ago now, Macy and I took a trip out of Florence. We were kind of airbnb in it, just kind of huffing it and getting on different trains and we got to see Italy. Anybody been to Italy before? It is like my favorite country to visit. So we went to Rome, we went up to Pisa, we did like the tower thing where you're like pushing it, you know, you have to do that picture. It's like you can't go all the way to Italy without pushing a tower over. Um, and then we ended up in Florence. Florence ended up being my favorite city. We got, to, we got to see the Duomo, it was just this beautiful cathedral. And then we ended up going to the Academy. Anybody make it to the Academy? Like this is the heart, the birthplace of the Renaissance. So it's just the most beautiful art you could imagine. In the Academy is, is where the David is. This is one of Michelangelo's most important sculptures and pieces. And so we show up there and <clears throat> we get, we kind of get in line. And by the way, Europeans are really bad at lines. It was like two and a half hours long, hot. I'm like, let's speed this up. We need some American efficiency here, but that's another sermon. It's coming to Romans 11. Um, <laughs> yeah, I got you. I got Jackie. <laughs> Uh, but the whole, the whole point here being is, is, is like we're, we're there. We want to see this thing. We're just waiting outside. We're kind of, it just feels like we want to get there because we want to see the David. We're looking to the end of the museum. Like that's why we are here. You walk in, you get your ticket and you kind of come around this corner and you can actually see the David. Like it's at the end of the hallway and it is this just towering figure of what humanity is supposed to look like. If you've ever seen it, you know what I'm talking about. It is just an incredible work of art. But if you're not careful, you miss what goes along in the hallway with it. If you've walked that hallway, you know that that hallway is full of what are called the unfinished prisoners or the unfinished soldiers. It's actually another piece that Michelangelo was commissioned to sculpt. It was commissioned by, for, for a pope and the pope didn't fund it. And so he stopped working on it, right? Uh, all, but all, there's four of them and they're like along the way, you're looking at the David and here you have these figures of humanity who are still trying to break free and emerge. Like you can see parts of their faces. You can see parts of their arms. You can see parts of their legs emerging out and breaking free from this rock. Some of them are three quarters done. Some of them are one quarter done. Some of their faces are halfway done. Some of them are marred. But, and, and, and when you see it in contrast to the David, it is this stark contrast of humanity. This is what humanity is supposed to look like. But here are these unfinished, for now hundreds of years, soldiers. They're underfunded, unfinished, humanity emerging from the rock, and they'll never be finished. They'll never reach their final state. And what Paul is saying here is that God has no unfinished soldiers. Every single one of us is being sculpted into the image of Jesus Christ, and God will not stop until it's done. Isn't that good news? That there's not one of us who is going to be that rock that rock figure of a humanity that is trying to break free from this bondage, but that through Jesus Christ, God uses every single one of life's circumstances together for good. And what is the good? That you would be like Jesus. And what Paul is saying is that no matter where you've been, no matter where you are, no matter what your future is, if you are in Christ Jesus, then one day you will be like Christ Jesus. That you will be conformed into the image of his son. So my, my question for you is, what area of your life would you say, God, instead of resisting, instead of pushing back, that, that maybe Paul would use, you know, he talks about that thorn that he wants God to remove. What thorn in your life might God be using to make you more like Jesus that you need to open your hands to? Maybe it's the season of suffering and grief and your primary prayer has been, God, remove it. And I'm not saying that's a bad prayer. I understand that prayer. But maybe you also need to pray, God, use it. 
Maybe it's that thing that you want to be removed from your life that you've said, I I don't want that. But maybe that's the very thing right here that he says, God is working all things together for good. What is the good that you'd be like Jesus? Maybe that one thing in your life that you least want in your life right now is the thing you most need in your life to make you more like Jesus. That God works all things together for good. So the goal of God's redemptive plan is for you to look more like Jesus and God will do whatever it takes to make it happen. Second thing I want you to see that we can be certain about, if we're looking at this, that we're in this present moment of uncertainty, but Paul is highlighting our certainty. Not only is God good, and not only is God working everything, everything together for good for those who love him, to conform us to the image of his son. The second thing he says is that God saves. The second thing he says is that God saves. Some theologians have called what we're about to walk through the golden chain of salvation. I don't, I'm not going to call it that, but what I need you to see here is that Paul gives us five very important words that he wants you to be able to take to the bank as a comforting anchor for your weary soul. I need you to see five words that Paul is offering to you and to this church in Rome where he says, cling to these, hold on to these. These are a balm to your weary soul. The first one is this, God foreknows. God foreknew. Just listen to me. Before the foundation of the world, before God made anything, he knew you and he delighted in you. He has always been your heavenly father who is good and right and delights in you. He foreknew you before the foundation of the world. He knew your past, he knew your present, and he knew your future. And he says, that's my son, that's my daughter. That God foreknows all of those who are gonna be part of his family. And he delights in them completely, not because they've done anything, but simply because of who they are. And that's where he gets to the second verb. He predestines them. He predestines them. Some of you, some of you are like, well, here we go. Well, yep, here we go. I, I knew that you guys would have questions about this. And I know that some of you have questions about, about kind of this theology of predestination and Calvinism and Arminianism. But I, I, wanna, I wanna tell you, I did some really deep work uh, in, in the Greek Bible this week to understand what this Greek word predestined means. Do you know what it means? Predestined. You're welcome. Uh, but I need you to hear this as Paul's audience would have heard it. In the room, you have Phoebe reading a letter to a group of people. Half of them believed that they were called and foreknown because they were sons and daughters of Abraham. The other half of them believed we're second class citizens because we're Gentile Christians. We don't have this family lineage going all the way back to Abraham. And this group of people now hears what would have only been said about one class of citizens being applied to them. And he says, God chose you too before the foundations of the world. In God's household, there is no secondary citizens. There's no second class citizens. All have been predestined to love God. So, so maybe what you need to think about here is, is that in Paul's day, this wasn't controversial at all. He is anchoring our weary souls in the predestining love of God that says before the foundation of the world, before he did anything right, before he did anything wrong, like here's why it's good news. There is nothing about you that conditions God to love you. He just loves you. That's really great news. There's nothing about you that conditions God to love you. He just simply delights in you. So what Paul is doing in this moment of foreknowledge and predestination is he's anchoring our weary hearts in the character of God, not in our own actions. Does that make sense? He's anchoring our hearts in who God is. He foreknew you. He predestined you. So I know some of you might be asking the question, well, what about, like maybe I'm predestined, but what about my spouse or my wayward child or my, the, the person that I love? Maybe it's the person who passed away. What Paul would even say to those situations is he would say, God's predestining love is such an anchor for the weary soul that our hope is in God, not in that person. Not, our hope is not in that person coming back. Our hope is in the character of God who will, next word, call them back. And that when God calls them, they will listen. That's the next thing he says. Though he, those whom he foreknows, he predestines. Those whom he predestines, third word, he calls. And the call there isn't this idea that God calls this generic call to all of humanity, but all who hear the call of God are effectually brought back as sons and daughters. And our, and, and our father who is in heaven, when the prodigal sons and daughters come running back who are effectually called back, he meets them at the doorpost and greets them with the most imaginably big hug ever. Why? Because he foreknows them and he delights in them and he calls them home. 
So our hope isn't in someone coming back. Our hope is in the God who can draw them back. Our hope isn't in arguments and our hope isn't in apologetics. Our hope is in the God who saves. The good news of salvation, what Paul is trying to get you to see here, it's not that God goes 99% of the way and then waits for us to do that last 1%. It's not that God says, hey, pick yourself up by your bootstraps, do the best you can and I'll finish it off. It's not that God says, try a little harder, do the best that you can so that you can be saved. The good news of the gospel is not pick yourself up by the bootstraps, it's get up out of the grave. The good news of the gospel is not that God makes bad people good, but that God makes dead people alive. And he calls them. And the dead people who are called emerge into victorious life, emerge into new life, emerge into this, what the Bible would call regeneration. Those whom he foreknows, he predestines. Those whom he predestines, he calls effectually. And fourth, God justifies. God justifies. Those whom he called, he justified. That's language that the reformer Martin Luther would say, this is the doctrine on which the church stands or falls. The doctrine that says that those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ have been justified. I'd never heard it this way before, but somebody at the nine o'clock said, I've heard a preacher say it this way, justification is the doctrine that is just if I had never done it. That's, that's basically what the doctrine is getting at. The doctrine of justification is this idea of substitutionary atonement. Big theological word, but important for you to know. It's that the Lamb of God came, was slain for the sins of the world, and those who have placed their faith in him watched their sins go to the cross and be buried in a tomb because he become, became unjust so that we could be just. The one who committed no sin takes upon our sin. The one who should have received life receives the penalty of death so that those who should have received the penalty of death receive life. So that those who should have been unjust receive justification. So that those who should have been in the tomb get to emerge from the tombs victorious. Justification by grace through faith in Christ alone. He justifies. So if you are in Christ, the good news of the gospel is that no matter what you've done, no matter what you're doing, no matter what you do, you stand justified before a holy God, not because of what you've done, but because of who Jesus is and what he accomplished on your behalf. Justification by grace through faith in Christ alone so that you could be called righteous. So think about that for a second. What sin comes to mind when I say you're a sinner? Maybe it's that shameful thing that nobody in here knows that you did. Maybe it's that thing that you're hiding currently that you're ashamed to bring into the light. Maybe it's that thing that just when you think about, you think to yourself, Pastor, I know that God loves sinners, but how could he love me? I get it. I understand it. I understand what you're saying, but certainly not the sin that I've committed. Certainly not how far I've gone. Certainly not the shameful deed and the acts that I've been participating in or am participating in. If that's where you are, I need this doctrine of justification to hit home. If you place your faith in Jesus Christ, your sins, all of them, past, present, and future, small and infinite before a just and holy God are invisible because Jesus Christ has paid for every single one of them at the cross. And that you do not stand condemned. Romans 8 verse 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The doctrine of justification, the doctrine by which the church stands or falls. Fifth word, this one blows my mind. He said, God glorified. He glorified. So one thing that's really interesting about this one, if we're reading it in the, in the, in the, you don't have to read it in the Greek, but in the Greek, something emerges a little bit more. It's called the aorist tense, which means past tense, like completed, absolutely done. And those first four words, for Christians, we can say, that's already been accomplished. Before the foundation of the world, God foreknew. Before the foundation of the world, God predestined. Before the foundation of the world, God called. And then he actually called me. Like that freshman kid, me, sitting up at the CSU Student Center, and God called me to himself effectually while I'm eating a Whopper. If that doesn't get you to believe in the effectual call of Jesus Christ, I don't know what does. He called me. It wasn't a, it, somebody read the four spiritual laws to me in the most uncompelling gospel presentation in the history of the world, and he made a Christian out of it. And he justified me in that moment. All past tense, right? Anybody in here glorified? You got a glorified body yet? If my wife was here, she'd be one. But other than that, nobody else, right? 
Nobody has a glorified body. I don't have one. It takes 12 hours of sleep for me to get over this stinking cold. I'm on the struggle bus up here. Anybody else on the struggle bus today? You're like, the thing, the, 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 my, that back problem I got, that foot issue I got, you're like, certainly, I, like, there's moms in the room, and they're like, this is my language. Like, we are not working the way we used to work or the way we were meant to work, amen? No glorified bodies in here. If we can agree on anything, we can say that all of us collectively are on the struggle bus, amen? So how in the world can Paul say glorified past tense? How in the world can Paul look at a very broken church in Rome and look at me and you and say, yeah, he foreknew you, he predestined you, he called you, he justified you, and say past tense glorified. He can say it with such, such conviction and such certainty because Paul is absolutely certain about your, your future, your future resurrection, your future emergence from the grave, that you will one day leave sin and death and this world behind completely. He's so certain that that day is coming for you that he can talk about it in the past tense. That is good news, that he would apply a future reality, justification by grace through faith, emergence from the grave, sanctification, no more sin, no more shame, no more suffering, no more pain. That day that we've been talking about, that day where Jesus Christ will get on his knee and wipe away every single tear of our eyes and that we will have glorified bodies that are no longer suffering in this world. Paul is so certain that that day is coming for me and for you that he speaks of it in the past tense. He glorified you so that the Christian hope can be certain in this life of uncertainty when all of these things are moving around us and it feels like the ground is shifting. Paul wants you to move your eyes from the uncertainty of this world to the certainty of your eternal life. Paul wants you to transition your gaze from the things in this world that he says are uncertain in this present suffering to the things that are certain. God is good. God works all things together for good. God saves, he foreknows, he predestines, he calls, he justifies, and he glorifies. When I was a kid, my grandparents lived in, um, I had a set of grandparents in Kansas City and a set of grandparents in Nebraska. So we would take road trips there. And when I was a little kid, I'd be sitting in the front, front seat and you know, my mom or dad would be driving or my stepdad. And you ever see that mirage in the road? Anybody see that before? Like you, you're, you're looking out and like two, 300 yards out, you can, it looks like there's like a lake in the middle of the road. And when I was a kid, I was convinced that, I, I didn't know what a mirage was. I was like, there is a lake in the middle of the road. And I would convince myself without asking my parents what was going on, that it was just so dry that it evaporated. It's like, we get there, it's like, it's gone. Like, where did it go? Like it moves, it moves and all of a sudden it's like gone. It's like, how does that happen? And I think sometimes the Christian life can feel like that, right? We are so convinced about the things that we aren't meant to be convinced about that they actually become mirages. We're so convinced about the things we shouldn't be convinced about that they're mirages, there's things moving. We try to explain them away. But what Paul is saying is the gospel of salvation is not a mirage. It's an oasis of certainty that Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection on your behalf. That the gospel is not a mirage that we have to explain away or wonder when it's coming. Paul says it is coming and it's on its way. Why? Take it to the bank because God is good. Because God is good. Salvation is not a mirage that we never reach. It's an oasis of certainty that we can take to the bank because of the nature and character of God. I wanna ask you a couple questions as we wrap up. Um, before I ask this question, I just wanna simplify this in case you're still kind of like, okay, help, help me see this. We are living in a present moment of suffering. Something that will wreck your life, something that will destroy your marriage, destroy relationships, something that will create pain in your life is you being certain about a hope that was never promised to you. About you looking at this present world and saying, I'm gonna be certain that I'm gonna be married for 60 years. I'm gonna be certain that my kids are gonna grow up and behave a certain way. I'm gonna be certain that I'm gonna have this kind of job. I'm gonna be certain that I have the health that I have now forever. I'm gonna be certain that one day I'll have the wealth that I want to have. None of those things are promised to you, friend. This life is a moment of uncertainty. And when we place our hope on uncertain things, we are on shaky ground. So Paul is saying to us, those who live in this present age of suffering, do not be certain about the things that are movable, but rather place all of your certainty on the things that we absolutely know. God is good, amen? So that when we're walking through that season of suffering, 
when we're walking through that diagnosis, when we lose a spouse, when we lose a child, when we lose our jobs, when we don't have the spouse we want, when we're asking God to take away that mental illness, it's good to pray for those things and say, God, this, this would bring me delight, this would bring me joy, but God, also, would you use this present moment to shape and form the image of Jesus Christ in me? And not only would you do that for me spiritually, would you do it in the future? Because I believe that you're saving me, that you foreknow me, you predestined me, you called me, you justified me, and you glorified me. That's what Paul's saying. So my, so my question for you is this. First question, is there something in your life that you need to surrender today and stop praying, God, remove it, and start praying, God, use it? Is there something in your life that you need to stop praying, God, remove it? And maybe not stop praying. Maybe it's something you should keep praying for, God, remove it, God, remove it. But until you don't or until you do, God, would you also use it to make me like you? Is there something in your life today that you would say, this thing that I have been asking God to remove, I've been asking him to take it away, and I still want him to take it away, Pastor, but I also want him to use it to make me more like Jesus. I want him to keep sculpting away. I don't want to be the unfinished soldier. I don't want to be the prisoner in stone. I want to be conformed to the image of Jesus. And God, whatever it takes for you to do that, I'm in. Use any means necessary for my good to make me look more like Jesus. Second thing I want to ask you is this, and it's kind of a two-part question. I think there's people in this room today who are hearing the gospel for the first time, and I want to give you in a moment, I'm going to pray, I'm going to give you an opportunity to believe. This is the good news of the gospel that we can anchor our weary souls in, that there's nothing that you have done to merit or earn salvation, but Jesus Christ has purchased and paid for every single one of your sins, and he stands ready to extend forgiveness to you and eternal life that you could have everlasting life with him. And I want to give you the opportunity to believe. But for those of us who have believed, and maybe you believed for a long time, perhaps you've been a Christian for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 10 weeks, I don't know. Isn't it good to remind ourselves of the things that we can be absolutely certain of? And I wanna invite you in, in this prayer in just a moment to allow God to return you to that initial joy of salvation. Maybe you're here weary, weak, wounded, a sojourner on a hard path, and you're just like me, you're just trying to make it this week. And maybe you just need to be reminded that God delights in you. He foreknew you before the foundation of the world. He predestined you as his son, his daughter. He says, remember when you came to me? Remember when I called you and you, you moved from death to life? Remember when I took that heart of stone and made it flesh? Remember when you were in that domain of darkness and I brought you into the kingdom of my son? And we get to rejoice today saying, Jesus, thank you. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Maybe God would remind our weary hearts just how good he is. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. We delight in hearing it. We delight in reading it and allowing the Holy Spirit to use it in our minds and in our hearts. Father, I just pray for the men and women in the room. Maybe there's men or women here who need to just ask you, God, would you make me more like Jesus? That thing that I have been walking through and asking you to remove, would you use it to make me more like Jesus? Maybe it's suffering, maybe it's doubt, maybe it's a challenging relationship. God, would you make your church more holy? Would you make us more like Jesus by your Holy Spirit? Father, I also just pray for the, maybe there's a man or woman or a handful of them in the room who've heard this before, but have never been called. Holy Spirit, would you call them? Would you convince, convince people here that you love them and that Jesus died for them and that they can have everlasting life? That if it sounds too good to be true, they've heard it exactly right. That you have extended grace and mercy to sinners. Would you call your family home, Holy Spirit? And if you have believed, I wanna have a conversation with you after the service or with one of our elders or prayer team up here. But also, Father, for those who who have believed, they, 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 they believe these things, they say amen to these things, would you continue to, to take them from our mind and root them in our hearts? That when we live hard weeks or when Wednesday comes and Thursday comes and we forget who you are, we forget your character, we forget what you're doing, we forget how much you love us, would you remind us that before the foundation of the world, you knew us, you knew our names, you knew all about us. That there's nothing that we can do to lose favor with you. We've not merited it in the first place. But then when you look at us, you see Jesus. 
would you just help us to delight in the simple gospel message again? Just allow our hearts to overflow, to sing with gladness and thanksgiving because of who you are and what you've done. Father, place our feet on the firm foundation of the gospel. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. The night that Jesus was born,